tonight the National League Championship Series returns to Veterans Stadium where they've been waiting 10 years for the return of the World Series. The Fall Classic will be back here if the Phillies beat the Braves tonight. Hello again everyone and welcome back to the vet. I'm Sean McDonough joined by Tim McCarver and it's great to have you with us for game six. The Braves down three games to two as we mentioned during the pregame they were in the same situation in 1991 when they went to Pittsburgh and behind shutouts from Steve Avery and John Smoltz the Braves won the NLCS and went on to the World Series. So they know what it takes. Meanwhile the Philadelphia Phillies haven't been in this position in a while and it's improbable that they would be in this position considering the way this series has gone a lot of unlikely events. Yeah because I'll tell you Sean it has been a bumpy road in a dune buggy for the Philadelphia Phillies. Think about how they've won the three games and what all has occurred in the three games that they've won. Kim Batiste with two errors. He was a late inning replacement, but he had two reprieves. And speaking of reprieves, that's what Mitch Williams had. He's 2 0 with one save, but could be 0 3. And think about this as the stadium of the bazaar and the state of the bazaar. There have been 49,242 games played, nine inning games that is, over the last 25 years. And only once has a team won when they've struck out 15 times and left 15 men on base. And that was Sunday evening when the Phillies beat the Braves 2 to 1. Remarkable. Remarkable indeed. The pitching matchup for tonight's game six for the Atlanta Braves, Greg Maddox, and for the Philadelphia Phillies, Tommy Green. We'll have the first pitch from the vet right after this. For Bobby Cox and the Braves tonight, it's win and force a game seven. Otis Nixon leads off for Atlanta in center field, batting second, the shortstop Jeff Blauser. Ron Cannon left field hits third. The cleanup hitter is first baseman Fred McGriff. Batting fifth in right field, David Justice. Terry Pendleton, the third baseman, hits sixth. Behind the plate, Damon Berryhill batting seventh. The second baseman Mark Lemke hits eighth and batting ninth the pitcher Greg Maddox. Tommy Green had won 13 in a row here at Veterans Stadium before the Braves beat him his last outing last Thursday. In that game he worked only two and a third innings and looking for a much better outing tonight. Let's check in downstairs with Jim Gray. Sean Bobby Cox told me that it's imperative critical that Otis Nixon get on base in the early innings tonight. The feeling is that if Nixon's on base he will distract Tommy Green and if Green is distracted he won't be making his best pitches to the plate and that'll free up the Braves power hitters. Sean Nixon was a big part of the series early on he started five for eight over the first two games but since then Otis is two for his last twelve. So he digs in at seven for twenty for the league championship series. It is a raucous crowd already here at the vet. The first pitch of game six. A fastball in for strike one from Tommy Green. <laughs> Said third base umpire Terry Tata. And the count is one and one on Nixon. A ball and two strikes. Green 10 and 0 here at the vet this year before the loss that Tim spoke of in game two. And the 26 year old right hander threw a fastball. It was a check swing and a foul ball by Nixon. Yeah, those 13 wins in a row included uh, his last three wins of the 1992 season. Green, a big guy, 6'5, 219 pounds. He's from Lumberton, North Carolina. And he nearly had fellow North Carolinian Otis Nixon. On strike three, it is by far the chilliest game time temperature of the six ball game. 50 degrees as this one gets underway. And a full count on Nixon. Not much of a factor is the wind at eight miles per hour blowing across the field from left to right. And it's expected to get down in the mid 40s before the ball game is finished. Pay on bench. Well, Lenny Dykstra had him played perfectly. 
And to borrow a line from Casablanca, Jim Fregosi has rounded up the usual suspects. But a defense has not, that has not been suspect at all the last two games. Thompson, Dykstra, Eisenreich in the outfield. Hollins, Stocker at short. Morandini at second. John Cruck at first. And Darren Dalton behind the plate. And Jeff Blouser, with the batter. He looked at a fastball outside for ball one. Green, a former Atlanta Brave. He said the fact that he was facing his former mates had nothing to do with the pounding that he took in game two. Blouser lifts one to left center. Thompson and Dykstra. And it's Dykstra making the catch. They were each waving the other off the entire way, and still they nearly collided. Joe West behind the plate. Bruce Fremming is the umpire at first. Frank Pulley at second. Terry Tate at third. Jim Quick along the left field line and Jerry Crawford at right. Joe West is a story. He has a little bit of a history with the Philadelphia Phillies. We'll tell you about as the night goes along. He was booed lustily when the umpires were introduced before game one. Joe is up along the right field line and not much of a factor that night. But he'll be a factor perhaps tonight behind the plate. Strike one on Ron Gant. As the Braves offense has gone south in the last two games, a big part of it can be attributed to the struggles of Gant. He's won for his last 12, and his only hit over that stretch was an infield single. Not only that, but Ron Gant has ended innings striking out seven times. Four of those seven inning ending strikeouts have come with runners in scoring position. Green hoping for a 1 2 3 first. And Gant laid off the 0 2. Bobby Cox says it's not unusual for Gant to have a brief downward slide, and he's capable of coming out of it in an instant. And that's what the brave skipper is hoping for from Gant, who is so much a part of his team's success during the regular year. Well, that's what it takes in the playoffs. You're playing a maximum of seven games, and if you fall into a slump, you better come out of it in an instant. Or you see a season of 104 victories down the chute. The crowd roaring with every pitch. The one two is low. Green said he was not nervous prior to his game two start. He was simply a little bit anxious. And he felt that his big problem was too many pitches right over the middle of the plate. And that will certainly get you into trouble against big league hitters. The two two. Interested in uh, the comments of Darren Dalton in the pregame show about how Tommy Green was choking his fastball uh, in game one. That's usually what happens when you feel a little anxious. Instead of releasing the ball with a loose grip, you release it with a choke grip, and it actually takes something away from your velocity. Breaking ball and Green missed with it, low and away. Another full count on Gant with two outs and the bases empty, no score in the top of the first. And Fred McGriff, who's been the Braves' best hitter in the late championship series, is on deck. The 3 2 pitch in the air and left center, not deep. Thompson charging hard and makes the running catch. So the Braves go in order against Green on three fly balls after a half inning. Atlanta nothing and Philadelphia coming up. Jim Fregosi's Phillies are one win away from the World Series. Tonight Lenny Dykstra leads off in center field. Mickey Morandini back in the lineup at second base. Batting third at first base John Cruck. The cleanup hitter is the third baseman Dave Hollins. Batting fifth the catcher Darren Dalton. Jim Eisenreich is the right fielder hitting sixth. Batting seventh in left field Milt Thompson. Kevin Stocker is the shortstop batting eighth, and the pitcher Tommy Green hits ninth. Greg Maddox appears to always be one pitch ahead of his pitcher, of the hitters. He won game two, 
and won it lustily with a lot of run support. He was 20 and 10 during the season with a league low 2.36 ERA. Now the hero of game five, Lenny Dykstra, who won it with his home run off Mark Wolders in the 10. First pitch from Maddox, strike one. It was the second home run for Dykstra in the series. Lenny has hit safely in all five games in the league championship series today. One ball and one strike. Dykstra said that he told his wife morning of game five that he hoped that he would have a situation occur within the ball game that would provide him the opportunity to be the hero. He got that and then some. Well, empty. Had him played perfectly way over in the hole. And Dykstra is out. No score as the Phillies bat in the bottom of the first. How about that for unusual defense playing Lenny Dykstra who is usually a guy who uses all parts of the field in which to hit and Mark Lemke way in the hole probably guessing uh, off speed pitch from Maddox that's the pitch that is most often pulled. Mickey Morandini the hitter. Ball looked like a pretty good pitch. Very Hill didn't help it by dropping it. Morandini starting for the third time in the sixth game. And he's three for 11. Up the middle, off the leg of Maddox. It carries right to Lemke, who throws him out. One, four, three if you're scoring, and Bobby Cox is going to come out and make sure that Maddox is okay. Yeah, the Braves got the out, but are they going to lose uh, one of their prime starters as a result? This ball is scorched back through the middle, low and away, and it hits him on the right calf. Fortunately, Maddox turned that knee, otherwise he gets it right in the shin, and you'd have to think it would be more serious. This ball hit hard. Watch the right leg. Watch him turn it at the last minute, and the ball hits in the calf muscle as opposed to the shin. I'm sure he'll be all right. The ball was sharply struck, as you noted, and on this cool night, that's certainly something that we'll keep an eye on in the dugout or clubhouse between innings because there is the possibility that it could stiffen up. Let's take a look uh, while we have some time as Maddox throws to see if his legs are right. Ron Gann in left field, Otis Nixon in center, and David Justice in right. Terry Pendleton at third base, Jeff Blauser the shortstop, Mark Lemke at second, Fred McGriff at first, and Damon Berryhill once again behind the plate. Greg Olson may remember he was hit by a pitch in Sunday's game and coming down on that left wrist, he injured it. Uh, it is not broken, but his playing status is doubtful tonight. There's Olson. He felt that he could catch. Without much of a problem, the problem would be hitting that wrist hurt when he goes to swing the bat. John Crook and Maddox missed with ball one. Crook just won for his last ten. That one hit was an RBI double in the first inning of Game Five off Steve Avery, but got the Phillies off and running. is 27 years old. He's home in Las Vegas. He is falling behind Crook 3 0. Talked about how Greg Maddox will give you a pitch to hit, but it's usually not the pitch you're looking for at that particular time. He always appears to be one pitch ahead of the hitter. Ball four. After getting hit by the line drive, Maddox misses with four straight to Crook. Bobby Cox named yesterday as the National League Manager of the Year by the Sporting News. It was voted on by the 14 National League managers. But obviously, it was particularly meaningful because it did come from his peers. Dave Hollins is the hitter. He's had a very quiet LCS. Three for 18. But one of his three hits was a two-run homer off Maddox in Game Two. After Maddox. 
got hit by the ball off of the bat of Marandini through four straight balls. And you can just see Bobby Cox zeroing in on whether Maddox is all right or not. Cox said he feels good about his team's chances heading into these two games. He hopes there will be two because he has Maddox tonight and Tom Glavin of game seven is necessary tomorrow night. Glavin. Maddox has to come out early. That changes the picture entirely. Mm -hmm. Glavin, a Cy Young Award winner in 91, and Maddox won the Cy Young Award last year. Greg has thrown five straight balls, and that's number six. He hasn't thrown a strike since getting hit in the leg. And Barry Hill is out to the mound to chat with him. Greg Maddox led the National League in ERA. He also led in innings pitched. Led the majors in those two categories. He also led in allowing the fewest base runners. A little over nine and a half a game. That's a little over one per inning. He is, in the words of Jim Fergosi, the best pitcher in the National League. And after six straight out of the strike zone, he's in. With strike one to Hollins, two and one. Damon Berryhill has taped all of his fingers, and the reason catchers do that is often when they put down the sign, there's that shadow in there, and pitchers have a difficult time picking the signs up. Chopped up the middle, Lemke backed up on, and had to hurry the throw to get Hollins. After one in Philadelphia, no score. No score after an inning and as you might imagine there was quite a crowd around Greg Maddox when he arrived in the Braves dugout everybody concerned in the Atlanta dugout about his well being after being hit on the leg by the line drive off the bat of Mickey Morandini looked like a boxer's corner down there cut man trainer in this case it's probably a bruise man <laughs> who was needed Fred McGriff the Braves leading hitter. He looked at ball one inside. Griff has had at least two hits in each of the last four games in this series after having one hit in the first game. Part of the problem for the Braves offensive late has been that in this series he's had to lead off nine times because of the struggles of Ron Gant ahead of him. A number of his hits have come leading off the inning. And the RBI opportunities for Fred. Every time he's up there, it's an RBI opportunity. He did knock himself in as he did with a tremendous blast off Tommy Green in the first inning. So game one that set the tone for that night. Game two, pardon me. And here is uh, the home run, a two run shot. First ball hitting, first inning. Right fielder Jim Eisenreich. Looked like he was in New York for the first time looking up at that looked like he was trying to find a skyscraper. That's how high it was hit. And he's able to take a certainly suspect after that home run was listed at 438 feet. It was an interesting fact after the ball game that McGriff Gant and Justice combined for 113 home runs this year that totaled according to the tail of the tape 44,661 feet. The home runs travel to combine eight and a half miles. And McGriff's in game two, about three and a half miles. It was two nothing Atlanta after the first inning of game two on the McGriff home run. Eight nothing after three, and the result was never in doubt after that. Both Maddox cruising along. Green has gone to a full count with three of the first four hitters. He retired the side in order in the first on three fly balls. He'll face McGriff, Justice, and Pendleton here in the second. Green has thrown McGriff eight straight, make that seven straight fastballs, and the more fastballs in a row you throw the hitter, the better they have to be. So he went away from the fastball and missed in the dirt with ball four. Braves have their first base runner McGriff at first leading off the second in a scoreless game. 
Hey, when uh, hitters like McGriff keep fouling balls off like that, you, you can feel it as a catcher that you better go to something else. You know that a hitter of McGriff's caliber is on that pitch, and that's why Dalton called for the splitter on that last 3 2 pitch, but McGriff wasn't biting. David Justice is the hitter. Ball one, blowing in. Justice facing his former minor league roommate. Tommy Green was in the Braves organization. His roommate at AAA Richmond was David Justice. Justice set Tommy Green up on a date with a young lady named Lori Kidd, who is now Mrs. Tommy Green. Strikes and Darren Dalton goes to the mound. Maddox is back in the Atlanta dugout and apparently just fine. Seated alongside the rocking Leo Mazzoni. He stops the rocking for a moment to ponder the situation. Two and all on Justice. McGriff at first with nobody out. No score in the top of the second. Justice has just three hits in the series. He's three for 17. Has driven in four runs. Well hit and caught. Great leaping stab of the line drive by Mickey Morandini. Temptation on a ball hit that hard is to jump too soon, but Morandini times the jump perfectly. Nice play. And the Phillies have had a couple of miscues in the field in the last few games, but they've more than made up. For it with the number of outstanding plays they have made. Harry Pendleton looked at ball one that just missed. He's eight for 22 in the series with a homer and a team high five runs batted in. Yeah, the Phillies certainly set the stage in the first two innings of Monday's game. The two fine plays by Wes Chamberlain, in which he got assists to tie an LCS record, and the good play by Pete and Cabilia in left field. Pendleton, who has hit in every game in this series except the first game. Len Dykstra was over toward left center, and with a count two balls and no strikes, Pendleton is more apt to pull the ball, so the center fielder is over more toward right center. That's known as playing the count, and Dykstra does it well. With his appearance in this game tonight, his start. Terry Pendleton is now the record holder for most postseason starts by a third baseman, with one more than Greg Nettles. So now with the strike on Pendleton, it's two and one. Dykstra's back into left center. You'll see center fielders do that. It's known as playing the count. Fred McGriff, the runner at first, with one out, a count of two and one on Pendleton. Base hit out of the reach of the diving Morandini. McGriff stops at second. The Braves have their first hit, the ninth of the LCS for Terry Pendleton. And Atlanta threatens with first and second and one out. Morandini cheating towards second base for the double play. What makes it difficult for a base runner on a ball hit like that is if you're the runner on first, the ball's hit behind you, and you don't know whether the second baseman's going to come up with the ball or not. So you don't know whether to, to take out the shortstop on a throw to second or make the turn. And that's why McGriff didn't go to third. Damon Berryhill, four for 15 with a three run homer off Bobby Thigpen in game two. That blew the ball game wide open. Made it eight to nothing. Berryhill was the first batter to base Thigpen after Green. Was relieved by Thick Pen. That went flying all the way 
past Pat Corrales in the first base coach's box. Foul ball for strike one, one and one. Barry Hill makes contact, and the bat goes about 95 feet past Pat Corrales, who was getting out of the way. Usually, players who uh, hold the bat down on the knob don't have as much of a problem losing the bat as players who choke up on the bat. Because usually, that bottom hand, that's what that knob does, it prevents you from losing your bat. For Maddox to see the signs, mm -hmm. the tape on his finger, would that affect his grip on the bat or his grip on the ball when he goes to throw? I don't think it uh, would affect his uh, grip on the bat, but if it affected his grip on the ball and throwing, he'd take the tape off. But he's wearing that tape so the pitcher once again can see the signs in the shadows between the legs. Up the middle, Morandini backhand. That's one on the first, that's two. 6-3, that gets Tommy Green out of the inning. After an inning and a half, no score. Welcome back to Veterans Stadium. I just spoke with Dave Persley, the Braves trainer, and he said that Gary Maddox sustained a very deep bruise in his right calf on the soft tissue. Now, they applied a pressure bandage during the half inning to stop the bleeding. It could give him some trouble if it tightens up, and they're going to keep a very close eye on it. Sean? Thank you Jim Greg's first pitch of the inning to Darren Dalton was strike one Dalton three for 15 but one of those hits the big solo home run in the ninth inning of game five that turned a two nothing lead into a three nothing lead and that turned out to be a very big home run that kind of got lost in the shuffle mm. when the Braves came back to score three runs to tie in the bottom of the ninth. Dalton chased the ball in the dirt. One and two Maddox to face Dalton Eisenreich and Thompson batters five six and seven for Philadelphia no score as the Phillies hit in the second. Dalton thought about it and thought better of it two and two. You mean you think about that sequence second pitch was up and in and then the fastball was down and then the fastball just missed away Maddox is all over the strike zone with his pitches. Break that one to right, but right at justice for the first out. We mentioned that the Phillies have a little bit of an unpleasant history with the home plate umpire Joe West, an angle of tonight's game that's been played up locally, and it dates back to August 9th of 1990. White Gooden at the plate in the game between the Phillies and Mets at Shea Stadium. He was hit by Pat Combs and charged the mound. A bench clearing brawl ensued. And as they were untangling the bodies, there's Joe West slamming Dennis Cook, then of the Phillies, to the ground. They've had some other unpleasant episodes since, but that was what started the bad feeling of Philadelphians toward Cowboy Joe. Jim Eisenreich, the hitter, 2 and 0 the count. He's 2 for 11 in this series while platooning with West Chamberlain and Wright. By the shortstop Blouser. Quickly two down in the Philadelphia second. And up steps Milt Thompson, who has only one hit in nine at bats in this series. That one hit a double in game four off John Smoltz. in the middle and he took advantage of the misplay to move in a scoring position. We've talked about the unusual outfield position of the Braves throughout the 
series. And David, just as you're right, Sean, that ball is almost hit to straightaway center field, and the right fielder, Justice, has to field the ball because Nixon was playing so far into left center, he couldn't get to it. Thompson, alert base running, rounding the bag and taking advantage of the error on Justice. Single by Thompson, the first Philadelphia hit of the ball game. And the error by Justice, the first Atlanta error. Here's Kevin Stocker. Trying to end an 0-4-8 drought. Strike one of the knees. Here was the position of Otis Nixon against Mel Thompson. You can see he shaded way over in left center field. The ball was hit up the middle, and that's why Justice had to come over to field the ball. And he had to feel it, field it off the side, and that's why he missed it. Although by the time he went to play it, Otis Nixon was right behind him and appeared in position to scoop it up. 0-2 oh on Stocker. Fergosi kind of chuckled at all of the concern about Stocker when he was called up. After all, he was only 23 years old. Jim Fergosi said, heck, by the time I was 23, I had five years in Yeah, play. right, with the California Angels. The 0-2. Mm. Very close. And called the ball, one and two. Have you seen anything in this half inning that would indicate the leg is bothering Maddox? No. I don't think bruises. I think obviously if something's broken or chipped, or you get them out of there. But bruises, I don't care how deep the bruise is, you keep playing. Strike three. Maddox used that pitch effectively to left-handed hitters in his first start in this series. It's his first strikeout of the night. After two in Philadelphia, no score. Atlanta Braves are trying to become the sixth team facing elimination since the advent of divisional play in 1969 to win the final two games of an LCS on the road. And of course, the Braves did it themselves in 1991, winning game six and seven of that LCS at Pittsburgh. One to nothing in game six. And a combined shutout by Steve Avery and Alejandro Pena. And in game seven, John Smoltz threw a 6 8 shutout. Mark Lemke, the leadoff hitter. And the count is one and one. No score in game six tonight. Here's Steve Avery, who went eight innings in game six of the 91 LCS. Watch Pena pitch tonight. Line of the four hitter. Greg Olson drove in the only run in that game. Base hit past the diving truck. Mark Lemke ends an 0-4-7 spell with a base hit in the right field. Didn't look John uh, like John Krug got a break on that ball. He broke to his left first, and then the ball was hit to his right. I don't think he picked that ball up immediately. But you mentioned John Smoltz and the shutout victory over the Pirates two years ago. Bobby Cox telling us before the game that he will be available tonight for an inning, possibly. And if there is a tomorrow night, definitely. Maddox bunts. Green goes right to first. Two more Indini covering. It's a sacrifice. One four. And Lemke is in scoring position with one out. Well, Maddox squared around very early. Matter of fact, uh, Green was into his stretch, and Maddox was already squared around. The bunt's a good one. You see the barrel of the bat above the hands. Maddox with eight sacrifices during the season. Usually, if you have the barrel of the bat, if the hands are above the barrel of the bat, you pop the ball up. Otis Nixon, the hitter. No score in the third. The Braves have Lemke at second with one out. And ball one high to Nixon. Fly to center, leading off the ball game. on base in this series. Bear in mind he had 196 during the regular season. And as a result, only drove in 
24 runs all year. They knocked in four runs in the first couple of games of this series. A lot of that has to do with from the left side, he's not a powerful hitter and doesn't hit a lot of balls deep to the outfield when he does have a single. So it's tough for a runner on second to score. The one two. With the fastball over the outside part of the plate, Nixon goes down swinging for the second out of the inning. And first strikeout of the night for Tommy Green. That's where most right handed pitchers try to pitch Otis Nixon up and away for a strike. It is hard for him to get on top of that ball and line it the other way. And the swing was under it. Now Blauser. He took ball one high. Blauser fly to center. His first time up. Hasn't had much luck in his career with runners in scoring position in the postseason. Only two hits in 20 at bats. Batting with Lemke at second and two down. No score in the third. And a strike on the outside corner. I see a much more relaxed Tommy Green on the mound. You don't know, of course, it's a very, very good hitting lineup for the Braves. You don't know what's going to happen, but his approach is much more relaxed tonight than it was last Thursday. Finger pitch and the breaking balls, and it's two and two. Looks like a slider on the two one count. You can see that slider spin right there, and Blauser goes out after what would have been ball three. Green's already lasted deeper into this ball game than he did game two when he lasted two and a third. He's pitched two and two thirds tonight, and he's gone to a full count with Blauser. On their feet, hoping for an inning ending strikeout. And he did strike him out. We'll return to Veterans Stadium after this message and a word from your local station. From 1,000 feet above Veterans Stadium, the 194 foot long Bud One airship is using its eye in the sky camera to bring you the scenic shots tonight. Bottom of the third and Tommy Green leads off. He is certainly not an automatic out as you can see by those numbers a 222 average during the regular season. He had two home runs and 10 runs batted in. Those were the only home runs among the Phillies pitchers and no Phillies pitcher had more than two runs batted in with the exception of Green. He did not get a chance to bat in game two against Maddox. He was yanked before his time at bat came around. Greg will face Green, Dykstra, and Morandini. Nine, one, and two. That's chop foul. That's Larry Boa. Kurt Schilling. Should the Phillies win this series, he could well be the most valuable player. Even though he has not been credited with a win. Outstanding in each of his two starts. <laughs> Should Schilling be the MVP, he would be the first starting pitcher chosen as most valuable player of a postseason series without being credited with a victory in that series. The 2 2 to Green. It's a full count. Lenny Dykstra waits to follow Green. 
the payoff pitch from Maddox is a breaking ball. Well, that certainly shows some respect for the hitting ability of Tommy Green. He did not give him the 3 2 fastball, and Green drew the second walk thrown tonight by Maddox. Well, I think some pitchers have as much confidence in a slider to throw for a strike as they do a fastball. With Maddox, it's very difficult to, uh, to tell the cut fastball from the slider. They both look similar. Lenny Dykstra with Green at first and nobody out and look back at his heroic from the 10th inning of game five. With the score tied at three in the top of the 10th, he hit a home run off Mark Wolders. The Braves dugout was upset. They thought the previous pitch, a 2 2 fastball, should have been called strike three. Dykstra says, no way. That pitch was definitely outside. Bonnie Cox was still saying before the game. But the 2 2 by Wolders was a strike. Lenny said he knew he was going to get a fastball 3 and 2 because with Cabrera catching in an emergency situation, they didn't want to risk walking Dykstra. It probably would have been a double. Lenny got the fastball he was looking for and he hammered it over the fence in the right center. During the regular season, did Greg Maddox walk a pitcher? He just walked Green to open the third. It's the first time tonight the Phillies have had the first man on. Scoreless ball game in the home half of the third, and 2 0 the count on Dykstra. Interested in Greg Olson, uh, the catcher for the Braves. His remarks about Lenny Dykstra, they were teammates 10 years ago in Lynchburg, Virginia. And Olson said, you know what? Dykstra hadn't changed a bit. That year, Dykstra hit 358, stole 105 bases, and on that team was Doc Gooden, who struck out 300 in 191 innings that year. Lenny took all the way, it's three and one. Dykstra said the home run in game five that won the game was much more meaningful to him than his heroics that we documented during game five from 1986 in the playoffs of the World Series. He said, because then I was just really a bit part. I wasn't the man the Mets depended on. Those guys were Hernandez and Carter. So but now my team needs me to get the job done when the game is on the line. As he did. Bounding ball, base hit. Past the diving Lemke. Green rounded second and stopped, and Justice threw in behind him. And Green scampered back to the bag. So Lenny Dykstra has now hit safely in all six LCS games this year. And the Phillies threaten in earnest for the first time tonight with first and second and nobody out. Well, there are very few times that you can get a predictable pitch from Greg Maddox. Even when he is behind in the count, he'll throw off speed pitches and sliders. But Dykstra got a fastball and chopped it to the right side. And Green properly stays at second base. Now what do you do? Do you bunt with Morandini with the pitcher on at second base? Atlanta puts the wheel play on Terry Pendleton, the captain of the infield, giving the signs to not only Mark Lemke at second, but Jeff Blauser, the shortstop. We'll see if the third baseman charges and Blauser goes to third. Jim Fergosi doesn't like to bunt. And undoubtedly he's aware of the numbers. Morandini against Maddox that you just saw. That's mm -hmm. Part of the reason why Morandini is in the lineup tonight. And also, a pitcher is on at second base. And for the most part, pitchers, it's not that they're not good base runners, they're not experienced base runners. They don't know how to be flexible against the different defenses that Atlanta can employ. Morandini appeared to be taking a strike, and he did. One and one the count. It was Morandini who hit the shot back to the mound that caromed off the leg of Maddox that caused the concern for the Braves in the first. No score, but the Phillies are threatening in the third. First and second, and nobody out. Little pop up. Pendleton has room and makes the catch in foul ground for the first out of the inning. Jim Fragosi. Played it as he has for most of the season. Decided to forego the punt. 
And Morandini did not advance the runners. Yeah, well, I think in that particular instance, it's not that Morandini can't bunt. He's an excellent bunter. But you do have a pitcher on at second base, and I think that's why Fergosi opted not to bunt then. And the double play has been a great friend of Greg Maddox. 26 ground ball double plays induced by Maddox this year. Only Bill Swift of the San Francisco Giants induced more. And he induced one more. Truck a big swing and a foul ball. John Walk with two outs in the first inning. Tommy Green the runner at second Lenny Dykstra at first with one out of the third no score each team has two hits. The ball and a count of one and one. <laughs> I think if John Crook were a football player, it'd be hands down. He'd make the all Madden team, right? Without question. Not even close. So much attention paid in this series by the appearance of <laughs> players on both sides. Perhaps only fitting that in Game Six, John Crook should have ripped pants. <laughs> Obviously trying to pull that pitch. He goes to left field as often as right field. And Truck's big brothers Joe, who's 42 years old, Tom, who's 36, have been attending the game. Tom Truck says that John goes to left field so well because when they were kids and used to play ball in the truck yard, they had a garden in right field. He yep. pulled the ball over there, it was an out. So John had to learn to hit it to left and keep it out of the garden. The one, two. John at Thanksgiving dinner over at Leo Mazzoni's house, the Braves pitching coach, last year. And Mazzoni told him, he said, you know what? The Braves and the Phillies are going to be meeting in the playoffs next year. John said, I asked him who was going to win. He said he kept it to himself. The 2-2. Two -two. Bounce down to first. McGriff will play it at first base for the second out of the inning. The runners move up. Why well, ask how? That was the great headline of the back page of the tabloid newspaper here in Philadelphia, the Daily News. Because if you look at the numbers, it doesn't add up to a 3 2 series lead for Philadelphia. But obviously, you have to factor in that the two Braves victories were lopsided blowouts, and that has played a big part in their statistical advantage. Headlines in both cities in this paper. Oh, yeah. I enjoyed the headline after game two of the Philadelphia Daily News. When the Braves won, they even the series in one little piece. The headline said, Braves avert sweep. <laughs> <laughs> it's optimistic thinking. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Collins the batter. He's about due to deliver for Philadelphia. Only three for 19. As the cleanup hitter for the Phillies in this series. Matter of fact, the four and five spots for the Phillies, six for 35 in this series. Only RBIs came on home runs, a two run shot by Hollins and a solo by Dalton. Ball two. Two and all on Holland, who's a much better hitter right handed. Maddox wants to chat with Barry Hill. No score. We're in the bottom of the third. The Phillies have runners at second and third with two outs. Tommy Green, the pitcher, is the runner at third. He started the inning with a walk. And Lenny Dykstra singled Green to second. Mickey Moore and Deeney popped out for the first down of the inning. John Truck grounded to first, but the runners moved up. The 2 0 to Holland. It is 3 0. Oh. 
Aaron Dalton is on deck. Hollins looked at a fastball at the knees for a strike. Right down the pipe. Or at least it started out that way, and that little late tail on it. Aaron Dalton waits on deck. The 3 1 pitch. Off speed and just long. Collins walks to load the bases. Second walk in the inning thrown by Maddox in the third that he has issued tonight. Maddox will be facing one of the most prolific bases loaded hitters in the National League. Dalton batted with the bases loaded 29 times this year. He added two grand slams, two doubles, a triple, six walks, and 30 of his 105 RBIs came with the bases loaded. Leo Mazzoni on his way to the mound, and there will be action in the Atlanta bullpen. Steve Bedrosian running out there. He and Jay Howell are the only two players on either team who are yet to appear in this series. Talking about bruises, uh, the last inning, saying half and jest that if it's only bruised, you play. Well, I'll tell you, if, uh, if Greg Maddox, if the reason that he's wild this inning is because of his leg, and you would have to assume that that's at least part of it, uh, well, then it's got to really be hurting him. He's a guy you got to drag off the field. Certainly control trouble would be uncharacteristic of Greg Maddox. He's already walked three and two and two thirds inning. Bases loaded with two outs in a scoreless game in the third and Dalton looked at ball one low. Tommy Green is the runner at third. Lenny Dykstra at second. And Dave Hollins at first. dugout Maddox has thrown more balls than strikes to this point he's thrown 53 pitches 29 of them balls only 24 of them strikes the one grand slam that Maddox has allowed in his career was to Will Clark in the 89 championship series when Maddox was with the Cubs a ball low. Two balls and one strike. The seventh batter of the inning. Pop 
popped up in shallow left center. Could be in a trouble spot, and it is caught. Great sliding catch by Ron Gant to save two runs. But the Phillies get two on the double by Dalton. And after three, it's 2 nothing, Philadelphia. After three innings, the Phillies lead 2 to nothing on a two-run bases loaded double by Darren Dalton in the bottom of the third. Tommy Green, after a rough outing in game two, has pitched well through three innings of game six. He's pitched shutout ball, having allowed only two hits. And the Braves' offense continues to struggle with runners in scoring position. That's been a big problem for them in losing the last two games. And there's the catch by Gant on the pop-up by Eisenreich that kept it. At 2 0 Philadelphia, and Gant leads off the fourth. What made that play so tough for Gant is that he was playing relatively deep, and the ball didn't have a lot of hang time, and Ron had to uh, really hurry to make the play. It made a nice play out of it. Green pitches with a 2 0 lead in the fourth. Gant, McGriff, and Justice coming up. Gant flying to left his first time up. He's now one for his last 13. Greg Maddox back in the dugout after facing seven batters and allowing two runs in third. On the ground down the third, Hollins to his left. Wow. Now Fred McGriff. Who walked leading off the second. He was stranded at second. It is the only walk issued by Green to this point. In the heart of the order, McGriff, the only player performing at the level which you would expect, and Justice had their problem. Morandini playing a shallow right field with McGriff up there. The count of two and all. Oh. Outside three and all. Oh. The on base percentage of the Braves during this series has been very poor. That's why the Phillies led the National League in runs scored this year because of their on base percentage. It seems like whenever their thunder is hitting in the middle of the order there's always somebody on base. Lynn Dykstra leading the majors in runs scored with 143. So that on base percentage category a very very important category. Got to get got to have the guys to deliver when they're on but you got to get on in front of them also. Jim Fergosi says on base percentage is the most understated stat in baseball. David Justice lined to second. Warren Deedy made an excellent leaping catch on his line drive in the second. The double play ball. Warren Deedy to Stucker on the first run in time. It was a little bit slow in developing. And Justice ran hard to avoid the double play. He's at first with two outs. I think it was uh, slow in developing because Morandini wanted to make sure he caught the ball. Often you'll see a, a second baseman or a third baseman go to his right and the ball comes up and hits the heel of the glove. You have to soften the hands if you're an infielder. And Morandini did that to make sure of one. And by the time Stocker returns the throw to first, Justice has it beaten. You can see how deliberate Morandini was then, making sure of one. So that gives the Braves another chance with the tying run at the plate in the fourth. Two nothing Philadelphia. Pendleton fouls one straight back. Terry single to right his first time up. Of his last start of the regular season against the Braves. 
on September 24th here at the Vet. He was dominating the Atlanta hitters that night with eight in the third innings of shutout ball, allowing only three hits while striking out six. He combined with Mitch Williams on a shutout. One problem in that start on September 24th was eight walks. He's walked two tonight, both to Fred McGriff. Jack swing, was it a swing? No, says third base umpire Terry Tatum. Well, the Phillies have been getting a lot of breaks, and now I think the Atlanta Braves get a break. I believe Pin oh, yeah, he went around easily on that. So the Braves with a break right there. Oh man. Easy. That was not even close. And it's up to Pendleton to take advantage. With the count one and two. Now two and two. Showed you all the postseason starts for Terry Pendleton during his last at bat, 52 of them, a record for third baseman. He still has not played on a World Series champion despite all the trips to the postseason. He popped up the breaking ball along the left field line in foul ground now. Hollins called off by Stocker, and that ends the inning. After three and a half in Philadelphia, the Phillies two, the Braves nothing. Phillies lead two to nothing as they get ready to come to bat in the fourth inning. The only scoring in this ball game on the double by Darren Dalton with the bases loaded to drive in two. Meanwhile the Braves offense continues to struggle. They now only scored in two of the last 24 innings in this series. Yeah the Braves starters have only given up 10 runs in this series. So the starters are doing their jobs. But the offense has calmed down. Good Philadelphia starting pitching. They have matched the Braves pitch for pitch. Really, the only bad start by a Philadelphia pitcher in this series was Tommy Green's uh -huh. in game two. Mulholland pitched shutout ball for five innings before running out of gas, it appeared, in the sixth inning of game three. Bottom third of the order for the Phillies against Maddox in the fourth. Bill Thompson bounced a foul ball to level the count at two and two. Bill singled to center field and took second when the ball was misplayed by the right fielder Justice in the second. Yeah Milt hits Maddox better than any of the other Phillies 356 lifetime and the reason for that is Thompson's a good low ball hitter and Maddox to be effective has to keep the ball down and whenever a pitcher who has to be effective has to keep the ball down and he faces a low ball hitter no way do you try to come up in the strike zone try to blow him away. I mean Maddox is just strength against strength. Thompson has won more often than not. Stocker is on deck and then the pitcher green. Maddox a gold glove winner off the mound. High throw. And McGriff couldn't come down with it. Thompson stumbled and Lefty applied the tag but first base umpire Bruce Fremming Ruled that Thompson did not turn towards second. And will await the scoring. It's either the second hit of the night for Thompson or an error on Maddox, and they have deemed it an error on Greg. Greg made seven errors during the season. One of the reasons he gets to a lot of balls that often pitchers don't get to, but he has to try to throw the ball over the running Thompson. He had a high target in Fred McGriff, but this is the problem. You'll see it right now. If you're Greg Maddox, Watch the problem he has with Thompson. Reason McGriff can't give a target. The target would be right uh, at the head of Milt Thompson. You don't want to do that. You end up hitting the runner. Thompson was close to running inside the first baseline. That really wouldn't have helped his cause because the time, by the time Maddox went to throw, Greg was in foul ground. But the second Atlanta error. The first one did not prove costly in the second. Kevin Stocker was called out on strikes in the second. They pitch out, and Thompson was not running. Talked about Jim Fergosi not using the hit and run a lot of times. Often by pitching out early in the count, you talk the other manager into it. 
He's saying, now when you think about a hit and run, but now it's 1 and 0. Oh. Hey, maybe we'll give it a shot. Thompson is not running. And Maddox missed outside, 2 and 0. Oh. Larry Boa says Kevin Stocker reminds him of a former Major League shortstop named Larry Boa. They asked Larry, who does Stocker remind you of? He said, me. That's actually quite possible. Larry Boa was an outstanding shortstop for his playing days. 2,222 games played in the big leagues, and until Ozzie Smith tied it and then went ahead of it. Larry had played more games at short than any other national leaguer. And his name has come up in connection with a couple of managerial vacancies. Down to first, McGriff, the Blouser for one, back to first, six. Stocker beat the return throw from Jeff Blouser, and he's aboard with one out. And the reason for that is that McGriff's throw was low in the third base side. Watch the throw by Fred McGriff. We talked about how Maddox had Thompson to deal with. Well, McGriff has Thompson to deal with. He throws it inside the bag, and Blouser's return throw is not in time. You try to give uh, the shortstop a throw right around the letters. This ball to the third base side, and the throw late to first. Tommy Green, the batter. Squares to bunt and he fouled it off. Green walked, leading off the last inning, and he scored the first run. Second walk issued by Maddox to a pitcher this year. He did it once in the regular season. And the walk to Green proved costly tonight. The Phillies lead two to nothing. They're batting in the fourth. Five games of the series. Kim Batiste went from goat to hero. The error that allowed the tying run to score to the game winning hit. Braves with a 14 to 3 route highlighted by four home runs in game two. Tom Glavin pitched Atlanta to victory 9 to 4 in game three. And then Danny Jackson turned the momentum in game four. He also drove in the winning run. And Lenny Dykstra's 10th inning home run won game five for Philadelphia. The Bills return to the bet tonight for game six ahead three games to two and they lead tonight two to nothing in the four the win would send them to the World Series for the first time in ten years. Lenny Dykstra single to right and scored the second Philadelphia run last inning. He's batting with a runner at second Stocker and two outs in the four. Dykstra one for two tonight. He bounced to second in the first. Tried to hold up the swing and fouled it off. One and one. You wonder who has more movement, a Greg Maddox fastball or Lenny Dykstra? In the 10th inning of game five was the sixth of his career in the postseason. He's averaging a home run every 14.2 at bats in postseason play, and that's more frequently than the man known as Mr. October, Reggie Jackson. We asked Dykstra before the series started about commonly expressed opinion that. This series might hinge on his effectiveness. And he said, That's right. I'm the man for the Phillies. When I play well, when I get on base, steal bases, score runs, and drive them in, we win. And he thrives on being in those situations. Two 
Two balls and two strikes. Well hit and hook in down the right field line, and it is foul. He is the toughest two-strike hitter in the National League. He is undeterred with the count. It could be 1-0, 2-0, or 0-2. Here's a 2-2 pitch looking inside. He takes it deep but foul. Interesting to note that on the second pitch of the season in 1992, Greg Maddox broke the left wrist of Lenny Dykstra. Dykstra hits him well, and Maddox pitches him inside often. As a matter of fact, Maddox last year hit five Phillies. And uh, the Phillies later on in the season uh, talking about retaliating and pitching inside to Maddox. And Pagosa acknowledged before this series started that there was some, uh, still some bad blood along those lines. And Dykstra chased the ball to strike out and end the inning. Second strikeout for Maddox after four, two nothing Phillies. If necessary, the Braves and Phillies will meet in game seven of the National League Championship Series tomorrow night here at the Vet. Eight o'clock Eastern time is airtime with the first pitch at 8 12. The Braves need to win this game to force a game seven. Damon Berryhill, a one hopper back to the bottom of the first pitch of the fifth, and Tommy Green threw him out. Berryhill is now 0 for 2. If game seven is necessary, Tom Glavin would go for Atlanta and Terry Mulholland. For Philadelphia in a rematch of Game Three, and there's Mulholland who pitched shutout ball in Game Three for five innings before he ran out of gas in the sixth. John Smoltz would be available for relief duty tomorrow night for Atlanta. Danny Jackson would work out of the pen if necessary for Philadelphia. Mark Lemke singled to right his first time up. We have just received word that the Chicago Cubs have named Tom Treblehorn as their manager. He had been serving as a coach for the Cubs the last two seasons. Of course, the manager of the Milwaukee Brewers. 1986, the end of that season through 1991. Three and all the count on Lemke. It's an interesting search for the Cubs skipper. Takes all the way, and it's ball four. Two finalists were reported to be Treble Horn and fellow Cubs coach Tony Muser. And the general manager, Larry Himes, had both Treble Horn and Muser take a psychological test as part of the decision making process. Rather strange, I would think, especially after having uh, coaches uh, <laughs> under hire for uh, what, four years? But of course, Tom Treblehorn's an ex uh, teacher. I would think it's a little late to have psychological testing. It's a very strange thing. Maddox bunts and Truck tags him out. So the runner is in scoring position with two outs. <laughs> and in other baseball news in Chicago, George Bell released today by the White Sox. He certainly got himself on the hit list with his comments. Early in the American League Championship Series, he was openly critical of manager Gene Lamont. And Tom Treblehorn is the new Cubs manager, and George Bell is no longer a member of the White Sox. Otis Nixon, the batter, representing the tying run at the plate. We're in the fifth, and the Phillies lead two to nothing. The Braves' offense continues to struggle. I think if a psychological test shows up something you don't already know, you never should have hired him in the first place. That's right. I'd hate to think they would give us psychological testing to give us this job. That's my point. <laughs> Nixon a swing and a miss, and the pitch eluded the grasp of Dalton. So up to third goes Lemke. It will likely be a pass ball. It looked to be a pitch that could have been easily handled by Dalton. I right, may have crossed him up but uh, Darren Dalton talking to Tommy Green right now and uh, you, you can see when it when a catcher ducks his head in a situation like that it means that uh, the express is coming instead of the local he probably called for a curveball you can see Dalton and West smiling but uh, believe me that is a, a terrible feeling when you're looking for the curveball you get the fastball. 
But it is a pass ball on Darren Dalton. Green from time to time will afford the wild pitch. That's definitely a factor with the runner in third. And a very close pitch that was just outside on 0 2. 1 and 2 on Nixon. Just outside. Two nothing Philadelphia. Tommy Green has only allowed two hits through four and two thirds in it. The one two pitch is just outside again. He struck out Nixon swinging with a pitch in just about that spot in the third. Has battled from 0 and 2 to a full count. Should he reach Jeff Blauser with bat next? <laughs> the payoff pitch is low and inside, and a good stop by Dalton to prevent that one from going to the backstop. Green has walked two in the inning. The tying run is at first for Atlanta, and the go ahead run will come to the plate. Whenever a catcher has to cross over to make a play, it's usually a good play, and it was then with Darren Dalton. However, that pass ball not only allowed Lemke to go to third base, but it cleared second for Nixon, who had 47 stolen bases during the season. And with the Braves down by two, uh, that's a big big play instead of first and second and uh, Nixon at first base is the trail runner now second base is open for him to steal. What is the likelihood Cox would send him in this I, I think Nixon's on his own. I think you go when you feel you can make it. Lyles are for two tonight. Green tied him up with the first pitch and Jeff fouled it off. Nixon is 0 for 2 in stolen base attempts in this series. The Braves do not have a stolen base over the first five games plus. This year, most on the Philadelphia staff. And the count dictates something low and away to Blouser. So not only uh, is it a good situation to run, but it's a good pitch count on which to run. Green struck out Blouser with a runner at second to end the third inning. Now it's first and third with two outs. And the 0 2 pitch hammered into left field. Green threw a hanger on 0 and 2. One run is in, and now Thompson boots it. And Nixon moves up to third. And as he lobs the ball to third, Blauser goes to second. Blauser had stopped halfway between first and second. But once Thompson decided to lob it toward third, even though Nixon was already there, Blauser went the rest of the way into second. So it's really, it could be a double error on Thompson. Once for booting the ball, as Blauser drives in the first run of the game, so Milt boots the ball. It goes about seven feet to his right. There's the hit. Lemke scores easily. The in-between hop played into that really by Thompson. But now he goes to third base and Blouser, who was halfway, goes to second. I think you can give two errors on that ball because if Thompson comes back and throws to second base, then Blouser goes back to first. But Jeff seeing that the throw goes to third, he goes to second easily. That's that's an easy play to give two errors on, I think. They only gave him one. Fed him Blouser with an RBI, and Green made a bad mistake on 0-2. Gave Blouser a pitch he could line in the left. And now Gant. This would be a most opportune time for Ron Gant to break out of his prolonged drought in this series. He's 0 for 2 tonight. He's 
one for his last 14 of the series and in this series he's 0 for 4 with two outs and runners in scoring position. And that's the scenario here with Nixon at third Blauser at second and two outs. Time called by third base umpire Terry Tatum ball came out of the field foul ground on third it was retrieved by Jimmy Williams. a strike with a purpose pitch. The purpose is not to pitch Ron Gant inside but to get him back away from the plate so you can go outside. Green gave up a hit on an 0 2 pitch to Blauser. Now he's 0 and 2 on Gant. And that's strike three. Same pitch and the same result. And again, Gant does not come through for Atlanta in a big spot. Halfway through the ball game, 2-1 Philadelphia. First pitch of the bottom of the fifth bounced up the middle by Mickey Mordini and booted for an error by Mark Lemke. That's the third error of the night committed by the Braves, and we're only in the bottom of the fifth. John, you remember when we were talking earlier about Mickey Morandini and when a fielder goes to his right, that most errors comes when come when they hit the heel of the glove. That's what happened to Mark Lemke right there. It hit the heel of the glove and then his left knee, and it pops away for an error. Braves did not make an error in the first three games in this series. They've made five in the last three games. And Morandini draws a throw. Mickey stole 13 bases during the regular season. John Cruck is the hitter. He walked in the first and bounced the first in the third. The Phillies batting with a two to one lead in the fifth. Two runs on three hits, one error for Philadelphia. One run, three hits, and three errors for the Braves. With his strikeout to end the top of the inning. Ron Gant has now struck out five consecutive times in this series when he's come to bat with two outs and runners in scoring position. That is a record for a postseason series. Five consecutive strikeouts with two outs and runners in scoring position. Rich Gettman to the Red Sox did four times in a row in the 1986 World Series. And Gant has now in this series ended eight innings with a strikeout. That is also a postseason series record. Eric Davis, seven inning inning strikeouts in the 1990 NLCS for Cincinnati. And it was how he struck out, too, with the two fastballs on the inside corner. Most National League pitchers, the book on Ron Gann is showing the fastball in off the plate and then go away. Rarely will you see a guy challenge Ron Gant twice inside on consecutive pitches with fastballs. The 0 1 to Kruk miss. You mentioned that Kruk's brothers, Tom and Joe. Have been watching the games in this series in person, and they tell us that John's parents would desperately like him to get a haircut, and they're going to insist on it when the postseason is over. But John says the long hair is lucky for him. His teammates won't let him get a haircut. Things going as they are for the Phillies. Checked his swing after it was much too late, and the count is one and two on Kruk. Well, that swing was looking for the ball away and getting the ball inside. 
Watch how Kruk dives away and then Maddox ties him up. Looked like he may have hurt the uh, lower part of his back. Remember, he's playing with problems uh, in the lower back. He was reaching back there with his left hand. Collins is on deck as Kruk dribbles one down to first. McGriff steps on the bag. They have to tag the runner, and the throw's too late. Lauser tried to decoy Morandini, thinking that the ball went into left center field, but Morandini didn't go for it. So he's at second with one out. Yeah, you rarely are able to decoy a middle infielder, but uh, Fred McGriff has only one play. You can't take the chance to throw to second for the force out because you do have the runner with which to go. But you can see Blouser turning around and taking a couple steps toward left field. No way Morandini is going to fall for that. Now Hollins, who bounced to second, ending the first. He walked to load the bases in the third, setting the stage for the two out bases loaded double down the right field line by Darren Dalton. That has provided Philadelphia with both of its runs. Good sinking movement on the pitch from Maddox. One strike on Holland. Greg has only allowed three hits. He has walked three. All three walks over the first three innings. Morandini at second with one out. Two to one Philadelphia in the fifth inning. Up and in on Hollins. One ball and one strike. First pitch low and away. Second pitch up and in. You've often heard of football defenses and announcers saying, well, he's given the quarterback a different look. That's what Greg Maddox does. He gives the hitters different looks with all of his pitches. Up 
the middle. Great play by Maddox. Dalton hit a bullet, and you saw the quick reaction of Maddox, a big reason why he's won the gold glove among pitchers in the National League. And why he's led to the National League pitchers in chances in the last five years. Quick reactions. Wow. Jim Eisenreich, the man. He looked at a ball. Not only has Maddox led the pitchers in chances, he's led all major league pitchers in wins over the last six seasons, with four more than Roger Clemens. Eyes and right to short. Eisenreich throws him out. Dave Hollins with a two-run homer. It's 4-1 Philadelphia. We'll return to Veterans Stadium after this message and a word from your local station. After five innings, the Philadelphia Phillies have a four to one lead. They got a two run double from Darren Dalton in the third and a two run homer by Dave Hollins in the fifth. The Atlanta run on an RBI single by Jeff Blauser in the top of the fifth. Here's Fred McGriff to begin the sixth. He has walked twice. You might expect Green to be here with McGriff with the bomb that McGriff hit at the expense of Green in the first inning of game two. Tommy said if you're going to give up a home run you might as well go ahead and really give up a home run. Don't give up any wall scrapers. <laughs> Certainly the home run hit by McGriff was not a wall scraper. Uh, yes it was. It scraped that wall about 436 <laughs> feet away but the wall was about 100 feet off the ground. <laughs> and uh, at least 438 <laughs> feet from home plate. Right. Drifting toward the seats, and it'll be a few rows deep. Darren Dalton's bases loaded two run double came in the third with two outs to get Philadelphia on the board. And then Jeff Blauser singled an 0 2 pitch to make it 2 to 1, and very quickly thereafter, Collins hit a two run homer. They make it 4 to 1. The 2 1 pitch to McGriff is low. Justice is on deck, and then Pendleton. The last pitch to McGriff at 90 mile, miles per hour on the radar gun. Green has now thrown 84 pitches. And he has walked McGriff for the third time. Three of the four walks Green has issued. They get five walks now, and three of the five have gone to Fred McGriff. You mentioned the eight walks that Green gave up in his win against Atlanta during the regular season. Well, Green pitched a no hitter two years ago against the Montreal Expos, May 23rd and 91, and he walked seven in that game. Leo Mazzoni, his pitching coach throughout the minor leagues, saw him. With uh, three near misses in all three classifications, A, double A, and triple A. In the minors, Green took two no hitters into the ninth and a perfect game in the eighth and lost them all. Pitchers allowed to blow on their hand on the mound tonight because the temperature is now in the 40s. David Justice, the hitter. Philadelphia Phillies trying to end the run of the National League West in the LCS. The National League East team hasn't won the playoffs since 1987. Now the St. Louis Cardinals did it. Dodgers, Giants, Reds, and the Braves the last two years over the last five. Of course, these two teams will be in the same division next year. Both will be in the National League East. Along with Montreal, the Mets. And the Florida Marlins. Pendleton pops one up. Collins. Two of them. 
Pop ups the other way, an indication that Green's still throwing hard. Two outs at the top of the sixth. McGriff aboard at first for Damon Berryhill. Went into a 4 6 3 double play to end the second. He bounced back to the mound of the first pitch of the fifth. <laughs> Phillies have four runs on four hits and one error. Braves, one run, three hits, and three errors. Mark Lemke is on deck. the injury to Olsen and he is still bothered by the sore wrist you're not allowed to change your roster within the league championship series should the Braves qualify for the World Series they could make a roster change and perhaps activate Javier Lopez if Olsen is not a 100 percent on the ground in a shallow right field but that's where Morgan Gale was standing and he threw out Barry Hilder in the inning we go to the bottom of the six the Phillies four the Braves one Anheuser Busch's aerial ambassador is overhead. The Bud One airship traveling throughout the country on a national tour. The Bud One is piloted tonight by Tony Stevenson and Mike Hans with camera operator George Schatzma aboard. Clear and chilly night in the city of brotherly love. Game time temperature 50 degrees. It's cooler than that now as the Phillies bat in the sixth, trying to build on a 4-1 lead against Greg Maddox. Thompson singled in the second and reached on a Maddox error in the fourth. One of three errors committed by the Braves. The first two did not prove costly, but the third one did. And Lemke couldn't come up with a bounding ball by Morandini, and Morandini scored on the Hollands homer. Maddox has allowed three earned runs. And Greg has not allowed three earned runs in any of his last 14 strikes. Prior to tonight. Thompson safe at first on the ball hit the deep short. Well, you can't be everywhere. Jeff Blauser playing Thompson right behind second base. And a ball hit uh, to what normally would be the regular shortstop position. Off the glove of Blauser. On an infield hit for Milt Thompson. His second hit of the night and the Phillies fifth. And they have the lead man on for the fourth consecutive inning. Kevin Stocker, the batter. He's 0 for 2 tonight. Thompson stole nine bases during the regular season. He was thrown out four times trying to steal. earlier that Kevin Stocker only 23 years old but he only had 70 games of play with the Phillies and that makes him the second youngest rookie shortstop to play in that many games the other shortstop Joe Sewell back in 1920 he was a rookie shortstop and the way that uh, he got to Play in the World Series is a very interesting story. We mentioned it briefly in game one. Ray Chapman was the regular shortstop of the Indians, and he was hit in the head by pitcher Carl Banks and killed the only fatality ever in Major League Baseball, or I should say Carl May is not Carl Banks. That was the only fatality ever in the history of Major League Baseball when a pitcher is hit a batter. That's 
the only uh, time that a rookie shortstop has played fewer games than Kevin Stocker. One and one the count on Stocker. Who is home for his last 10. One and two the count. And Merker is warming up with the bullpen. When Kevin Stocker's twin sister Jill was at Harvard, she was the head cheerleader for the football squad. And she's in the stadium tonight, undoubtedly cheering more fervently than she ever has before. The one two pitch. Long and missed and struck out on the pitch way out of the strike zone for the first out of the inning. Looks like a changeup out of the strike zone, but you can see the intense concentration of Greg Maddox. Standing ovation for Tommy Green. Who walked and scored, leading off the third. He laid down a sacrifice bunt in the fourth. He's batting with Thompson at first and one out in the sixth. The Phillies lead four to one. A win tonight, and the Phillies go on to the World Series, which would begin Saturday in Toronto. A lot of times pitchers will see whether a hitter is bunting or not by taking their right foot off the mound very quickly. And Maddox got a pretty good idea about Green then. And he bunts. Maddox looked at second. And goes to first to empty cover. Second sacrifice of the night for Green. Thompson is at second with two down in the sixth inning. Two teams have combined to strike out 99 times now with the whip by Stocker in this inning. And that ties the National League Championship Series record for strikeouts by the two teams combined. Bobby Cox out to the mound. He has Merker ready. He's just talking to Maddox right now about whether to walk Dykstra or not. No, no thought about taking Maddox out of the game. The pitcher spot second up in the seventh inning. I think. Uh, he asked Maddox whether he wants to walk Dykstra or not. Morandini uh, up next. Morandini's hit a couple of balls hard tonight. Good pitch around him in this situation. Dykstra, now they're going to walk him. Bad ball. 
One and two. He doesn't give you many good pitches to hit. Orndini going for a ball in the dirt. One ball and two strikes. Two outs and two men on in the sixth inning. The Phillies four, the Braves one. Check swing. They want an appeal, and they do. And Terry Tatis has no swing. Two and two. Almost, but it looked like he held up. Even though the bat crossed the plate, the top hand didn't turn over on the right hand. That's usually the best indication from the third base umpire for a left handed hitter up there. And on the right field line, that'll be a fair ball all the way to the corner. Thompson has scored. Dykstra is being waved around. He will score on a two run triple by Mickey Morandini. Triple by Mickey Morandini has given Philadelphia a six to one lead in game six of the National League Championship Series. Morandini is at third with two outs. And the batter is John Crutton, who takes the first pitch from Kent Merker low for ball one. This qualifies as the worst start of the year for Greg Maddox. He gave up six runs, five of them earned, and is responsible for Morandini at third. He did not allow as many as six runs this year in any of his starts prior to tonight. And five earned runs within a single start is also the high for the year for Maddox. And one can only wonder how much of a factor, if at all, the line drive hit off his leg was when Morandini hit him back in the first inning. Brock, a big rip and a foul ball off to the left. of the outcome here tonight the World Series begins on Saturday at Toronto Blue Jays try to defend their world championship first pitch 8 29 Eastern time on Saturday night from Sky Dome on the air at 8 Eastern time over the mound Bowser throws him out and that ends the inning but the Phillies get two more on a triple by Morandini and after six they lead six to one and welcome back to Veterans Stadium in Philadelphia. The Phillies, where the win tonight would go to the World Series, and they're perhaps nine outs away, leading by five runs as we head to the seventh. Sean McDonough along with Tim McCarver. Braves offense has been quiet throughout so much of this series, really. When they have scored, it's usually been with the big inning, and that's what they're going to need again tonight. They've had four innings of four runs or more that they have scored. The record for postseason play, the Yankees in 60. Had four or more runs scored five times, and the Detroit Tigers in five different innings, also the 1945 series against the Cubs. But the one thing I think Jim Fergosi right wants right now is two more innings out of Tommy Green. You know, it's easy to say, well, you got a five run lead, but with the bullpen of the Phillies and how vulnerable they have proven, especially middle relief in this series, I think Fergosi wants at least two more innings out of Green. Well, he has needed big starts, has Fergosi, from his starters in the last two games, and he got them from Jackson and Schilling. And he's getting it from Tommy Green tonight. And he showed no after effects whatsoever from the shelling that he took in game two. 
Came out tonight and tired the side in order in the first, and for the most part, has had an easy time of it. And it makes easy work of Lemke to begin the second. This is the best curveball that Green's thrown all night. It freezes Lemke. His fourth strikeout of the night and the 100th strikeout in this series, the most in history in any postseason series of any length. Deion Sanders batting for the pitcher Merker. If this score stands, Deion Sanders might be an Atlanta Falcon tomorrow morning. Desire to return quickly to football. He says the Falcons are winless in part because they can't play the defensive style they like to play, blitzing frequently. They don't have Sanders in the backfield to play the man to man defense in the secondary. Two outs in the seventh. Back to back strikeouts in the inning for Tommy Green. You can see the tight rotation on that curveball. Darren Dalton realizes these Braves are an experienced lineup, and this is the fourth time through the lineup coming up, and Dalton is going to give them a new look. Those are two curveballs that Green has not used all night. Nixon tries to bunt his way on. Dalton on it out in front of the plate, safe at first. And the throw stung the hand of Crook and handcuffed him, and he took. The glove off very quickly, probably got it in the heel of the glove. Looks like his right hand. You're right, Sean. Darren Dalton's only chance was to throw it as hard as he could. It's a catcher's play whenever there is uh, a pitcher and a catcher in doubt because the catcher's going toward first base. The only thing he could do was air it out. It handcuffs Kruk, and Kruk's right hand uh, will be a little sore. Braves have their fourth hit and a two out base here in the seventh. And Jeff Blauser rips one down to the field line. And it is gone. A home run. A line shot down the line over the 330 mark for Jeff Blauser. And the two out punt single starts what will at least be a two run inning for the Atlanta Braves. And they're right back in it. It's six to three. One of the favorite baseball expressions is, let's have a bloop and a blast. Well, on two pitches, the Braves had a bloop, and now the blast. A bloop, infield bunt base hit, and I mean this ball is hammered to left. Only a question of whether it was going to be high enough. But this could be very disturbing to Jim Fragosi, and that's why he's out to talk. Or that, that's Johnny Padres, actually, the pitching coach of the Phillies. But now you're going to have to hurry to get the Phillies bullpen up. From a psychological standpoint, you see the left hander David West, the right hander Larry Anderson. But from a psychological standpoint, how quickly those two runs came shocked the Phillies momentarily. It's up to them, up to them to get back off the deck. The second home run of the series for Blauser, both at the expense of Tommy Green. Jeff had a solo home run on Tommy in game two. And even though the Phillies won game five, they have to have visions of the three run Atlanta ninth that forced extra innings. Absolutely. Ron Gant pulled one foul. And the four four run innings, four or more run innings, they can sting you in a hurry. And certainly the Phillies know that. Gant's over for three tonight. Two outs, space is now empty in the seventh. But a hush has fallen over the crowd, at least momentarily. Green walks the first to win the inning. The Braves get two on the Blouser home run. Seventh inning stretch, 6 3, Philadelphia. There's been so much talk in this series about the Phillies and 
their unkempt style, so they brought in Steven Gunzenhauser, <laughs> the music director of the Delaware Symphony, to lend a little class and dignity to the proceedings. And what happens? They stole his baton <laughs> as he was conducting the seventh inning stretch rendition of Take Me Out to the Ball Game. So, so much for oh. the point about oh. the dignified nature of the assembled throng and the Phillies themselves. Steven Gunzenhauser, the music director of the Delaware oh. Symphony, of tie and tails. <laughs> lost his baton. I'm glad that's Phoenix. all he lost. <laughs> Greg McMichael, ordinarily the Braves closer. The end of the ball game in the bottom of the seventh, charged with keeping it the three run deficit. No sense in saving a closer for later on, but it may not matter. The Braves have to win this game, or their season is over. Michael has struggled in this series in his first three pitches tonight, all balls to Dave Holland. Hollins, Dalton, and Eisenreich do up in the bottom of the second. The Phillies lead six to three. Hollins took a strike at the knee. Jeff Blauser's home run has made it a three run game. McMichael, the third pitcher of the night. McMichael pitched one batter and retired him on a ground ball. Hollins walks for the second time tonight. He also has hit a two run homer in this one. The Phillies have the first man on for the fifth straight inning. And here's Dalton. In the first big hit of the ball game, a bases loaded two run double down the right field line that knocked in the first two runs of the game. That was in the third. Dalton had a bullet right back to the mound, and Maddox was able to catch the line drive in the fifth. Series begins Saturday at Toronto. They'll host the winner of this series in the first two games. Then games three through five would be at the National League site. Game six and seven, if necessary, back at Sky Dome. The two two to go is pulled foul. We're in the bottom of the seventh. And the Phillies lead six to three. Bobby Cox trying to lead the Braves back to the World Series for the third straight year. Made it 91 and 92 and failed to win. They're trying to get there again in 93. But they're down six to three in game six, and they trail in the series three games to two. Chopped up the middle. Where the hole was in the infield. Collins to third without a throw. And McMichael is on the ropes again. 
He has not been effective in any of his appearances in this series. And Philadelphia has first and third and nobody out here in the center. Dalton hit the changeup for the home run, the solo shot on Monday. And McMichael with a steady diet of fastballs away, and Dalton leaning out over the plate, pops it through the middle. You have a situation here where you can't play back for the double play. Infielders, especially the middle infielders, have to play about halfway and determine if they can get Hollins at home on a ball hit to them. Hollins, on the other hand, if the infield does play all the way in, it puts a lot of pressure on the runner at third. Because what you want to do is make them think that you're going home, but stay at third. What you don't want is to have one out and runners at first and second after a ground ball to the infielders. Jim Eisenreich is 0 for 3 tonight. The infield is indeed in. With runners at the corners and nobody out. 6 3 Philadelphia in the seventh. Eisenreich bounced one foul pass first. With his 0 for 3 tonight, Eisenreich now just 2 for 14 in the series. Blouser into the mound to chat with the battery of McMichael and Barry Hill, and Terry Pendleton has joined them. There is nobody on the Phillies team that is better on the contact play from third base than Dave Hollins. He works on it all the time. John Vukovic, one of the Phillies coaches, told me he was the best he had ever seen at getting a jump off the third base on a ground ball to a closed in infield. And we'll check him out. Comes Hollins to the plate. Blouser's to the Out at home. You didn't want that. You did not want that. Now it's first and second and one out. I wonder if Joe West thought it was a force at the plate because it was tough to tell when Barry Hill tagged him. It was at the very least a very close call, and West made it so casually. Was he on the plate? He's yes, absolutely. He's be. on the plate when the tag was made. Here it is again. Watch Barry Hill. On the plate. He's on the plate when the tag was made. Here's a better angle. On the plate when the tag was made. But still, the Phillies did not want this situation first and second and one out. The play is six to two for Gosey had every reason to be been kind of typical of Joe West demeanor and one of the things that has caused problems for him over the years in the National League. Here it is an important call in a crucial game and as Larry Boa came down the line jumping up and down he waved at him almost in mocking fashion as if to say how dare you argue that call with me. Well the reason that for dared to argue was that Hollins was safe that's why. Watch him go over the leg. That leg's out there to try to block the plate. Hollins jumped over it, and clearly with that play, he was safe. So it's first and second and one out. The infield can play back now for the inning ending double play off the bat of Milt Thompson. Who's two for three with two singles. He scored a run, and he's also reached on an air by Maddox, so he's been on base three times tonight. Chopped over the mound. Blouser has to go to first. Out at first. Another close play. Well, you know why it was close is Blouser went towards second just about a half a step because he thought McMichael might have a play at the ball. He didn't know whether Greg was going to come to second base or not. And by the time he gets to it, the play at first is very close. Got it. Crucial situation here for McMichael and the Braves, and Bobby Cox is on his way to the mound with two men in scoring position and two outs. 6 3 Phillies in the bottom of the seventh. You know what they could do right here is walk uh, Kevin Stocker and just go ahead and pitch to Tommy Green 
Is Jim Fergosi comfortable enough to go to the bullpen in this situation, or does Green still have good stuff? Well, given that Jim said earlier in the conversation about Incavilia versus Thompson, that he would never replace defense in the late innings with a lead, mm -hmm. you would think if he thinks Green has good stuff remaining, he'd stay with Green and let him hit since he already has the lead and is more concerned with trying to protect it in the seventh inning. I think you go ahead and walk Stocker here and take a chance on Fergosi leaving Green in the ball game. If you don't and you get the pinch hitter out, then you've gotten into the weakest part of the Phillies pitching, and that's the bullpen, because it's too early to bring in Mitch Williams. And Fergosi, perhaps just to leave the question mark in Cox's mind, has the on deck circle empty. You got it. He doesn't have Green out there, nor does he have a pinch hitter, but that will be decided momentarily. Stocker looks at ball two. And Ricky Jordan has come out into the on deck circle. This is a tough decision for Jim Fergosi because he's got to decide right now whether you take a chance on getting some more runs. Tommy Green could be, well, he's pitched well. He did give up the two run homer last inning. But he I think that, I think. You properly do this right now. I mean, you, you've got to take the chance to put the game away when you have it. You may not have it again. Now, Bobby Cox is going to go to the hard throwing right hander, Mark Wollers, to replace the soft throwing, Greg McMichael. Big spot coming up. The base is loaded with two outs when we come back. This copyrighted telecast is presented by authority of Major League Baseball and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form without the express written consent of Major League Baseball. Mark Wohler's the fourth pitcher of the night for Atlanta. And he's into a crucial situation for the Braves. He needs to get Ricky Jordan out to keep it a 6-3 game after seven innings. Phillies lead six to three and they've loaded the bases with two outs in the seventh. I think the crucial thing about Wollers is throwing strikes early in the count. He can be very wild early when he comes in there. This is an unusual spot. The bases loaded in two outs. Ricky Jordan batting for the pitcher Tommy Green. Takes the high hard one and fouled it off. It was Wollers who surrendered the home run to Dykstra. In the tenth inning of game five. That home run won the ball game for Philadelphia. One ball and one strike on Jordan, who was a good pinch hitter. As the most frequently called upon bat off the bench by Jim Fergosi. 16 for 53 during the regular season as a pinch hitter. The 23 year old Wolves with the 1 1 fastball chopped over the mound. Blouser on the run, throw him out. Nice play by Blouser, and the Phillies leave the bases loaded. They've stranded nine. We go to the eighth. 6 3 Philadelphia. Tommy Green with seven innings of work. He gave up three runs while striking out five. The Phillies are six outs away from their fifth World Series appearance. They appeared in the World Series in 1915, 1950, 1980, and most recently, 1983. And David West is in in relief of Tommy Green. And Jim Fergosi wants to get an inning out of David West so he can go to Mitch the Wild Thing Williams in the ninth inning. But remember, Atlanta, the last time these two teams met, Atlanta scored three in the bottom of the ninth to tie it. The bullpen has been the sore spot for Philadelphia in the league championship series. Of course the starters ERA looks worse than it actually should be because uh -huh. of the one awful start by Green that inflated that figure. The Green had a very good night tonight. 
He went seven innings and allowed three runs. Meet of the order. Middle third, McGriff, Justice, and Pendleton to greet David West. West right down the middle of his first pitch, a fastball to McGriff, who walked all three times he came to bat against Tommy Green tonight. of one and one and John Smoltz will begin warming up in the Atlanta bullpen. Bobby Cox said he might use him for an inning tonight if he absolutely had to. And the, that situation for the Braves. One and two the count on the grip. Keep in mind that John Smoltz has never pitched in relief in the major leagues. Last time he pitched in relief was 1986. McGriff called out on the pitch over the outside part of the plate around the knees. Rarely do you get Brett McGriff on three called strikes. But this last one, you'll get any left-handed hitter with that one. Watch where this pitch is. Right on the black. Justice. Foul ball for strike one. David is 0 for 3 tonight and just 3 for 20 in the series. Six three Philadelphia, one out of the base is empty. In the top of the eighth inning. David West, the 29-year-old left-hander, on in relief for Tommy Green. Twice this year have the Braves won games in which they trailed by five runs. Nice play by West. It was a sharp one, Hawker, and he threw out Justice. Artificial surface, the ball gets back to a pitcher very quickly. Rarely is it a routine play if the hitter hits it hard. Those two games, by the way, in which the Braves overcame five run deficit to win. May 8th, they came from six runs down to beat Colorado. And on July 20th, which was Fred McGriff's first game, they came from five down to beat St. Louis. That was the night the ball game was delayed by the fire at Atlanta Fulton County Stadium. Terry Pendleton looked at ball one high. He's one for three tonight. He singled his first time up. And Chris Williams is warming up. I tell you, you, you wonder the way West is throwing, why you would bother to bring in Williams in a game like this. I mean, West is just overpowering two good left handed hitters, McGriff. And justice. So many managers these days fall into that trap. Right? This guy's my closer, and no matter how the pitchers before have done, if we get to the ninth, we have the lead, he comes in no matter what. That yep. wasn't always a good idea. Fans on their feet hoping that West will strike out Pendleton to put the finishing touches on a one two three in it. A one two pitch outside.
for West to retire Pendleton because if he does, it means the bottom third of the order, seven, eight, and nine hitters would be scheduled in the ninth. Barry Hill empty and the pitcher spot. Could conceivably stay away from the top of the order. Or the one, two, three inning of the ninth if they get better than here. It's a good point because uh, even if the Braves get a couple of guys on, they've worked deeper into the lineup to where they can get a guy like Nixon and Blouser, who has already homered. And then you get to the meat of the order. So it's not only important for the Phillies to get out of the inning, but to get Pendleton, too. Pendleton has fouled off a couple of two two pitches. And the breaking ball here to slip out of the hand of West. So now it's a full count with two outs. And the base is empty in the eighth. The Phillies lead six to three. West a reliever for the first time in his career this year. For the most part, he had been a starter entering 1993. Jim Pagosi says this is in the new territory with David West. They don't know how he'll respond to this many appearances. Money on that fastball, and Pendleton popped it foul straight back and out of play. The Bud One airship, which holds 235,000 cubic feet of helium, will use its eye in the sky camera for aerial shots during the World Series as well. And we look forward to having the Bud One airship overhead at the Fall Classic, which begins Saturday night in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. The opponent still to be determined. The Philadelphia Phillies are zeroing in on it. Three outs away from winning game six and earning that trip to Toronto. And they'll look for some insurance runs as they bat in the bottom of the eighth with the top of the order. Lenny Dykstra against Mark Wollers. And the first pitch peeled straight back. And as we noted last inning, the last time Dykstra faced Wollers was in the tenth inning of game five in Atlanta. And he hit the game winning home run off Mark. Tonight, Lenny is one for three with a single. He was also intentionally walked in the sixth, the move that did not pay off for Bobby Cox when Morandini followed with the triple into the right field corner that scored two, including Dykstra. Morandini is on deck, and then Kruk, the police, made their presence known during the break between innings. They came across the field on the horses. Try to prevent the fans from running on the field in the event that the Phillies do win the game tonight. Good fastball. That registered 94 on our gun. Bowlers came on with the bases loaded in two outs last inning and got the pinch hitter Ricky Jordan to bounce to short in a very big spot to keep it at six to three. We sat on the plane ride back from Philadelphia, from Atlanta rather to Philadelphia, with Ricky Jordan's brother Flip, who was a drummer for the music star Bobby Brown, and then Ricky Jordan delivered a hit. They might have been banging the drum slowly <laughs> for Atlanta. But he bounced a short to keep it at six to three. And Dykstra started to pull the trigger. He did swing, says Joel West. Without asking for the appeal. Doesn't matter what Terry Tata thinks because Joel West has already rung up Lenny Dykstra. Now once the home plate umpire calls the play, there is no appeal. That's it. Now it appeared that Dykstra could have gone around. I think he went around. 
but he brought it back so quickly and now once the call is made Lenny is asking Joe West to ask Terry Tata well he can't do that he's out. Mickey Morandini who had a very big hit his last time up the two out two run triple into the right field corner. That at the time gave Philadelphia six to one lead the home run by Blouser cut it to six to three. Nixon the catch. Two outs in the bottom of the eighth coming up later following the game in your late local news it's the late show with David Letterman. Tonight his guests are Kirstie Alley and Rick Ocasek. That's tonight following the game. Well, that young fan will not be tuned in for the late show with David Letterman tonight. Well if the Phillies win I don't know about David's ratings tonight in this town because <laughs> I guarantee you there'll be a few people celebrating. Bullers <laughs> went all the way back to the backstop and it certainly does appear that Crux back is bothering him. He skipped out of the way of that one and he's been walking as if his back is sore. And you know the thing about it John tore his pants in the second inning and he's still wearing the same pants that he tore. It's almost like a badge of honor for him. There it is right there. He tore those back in the second inning. First time up. You know players have three or four pairs of pants and uh, really no need to wear the same pair unless you just like it that way. So it kind of fits in with yeah, the image. That sure does. And so much talk about image during this series. The one one the truck is slapped to left and Ron Gant puts it away. So if the Braves are going to go to the World Series for the third straight year they have a lot of work to do down by three as we go to the ninth. The Phillies lead six to three as we go to the ninth. The coordinating producer of Major League Baseball on CBS is Bob Degas. Tonight's telecast directed by Bob Fishman. Associate producer Stephen H. Shear. The coordinating producer of Baseball 93 is Eric Mann. Baseball 93 produced by George Veris. The senior producer of CBS Sports is Ed Gorn. And the executive in charge of production is Rick Gentile. And a special salute to all of our production personnel and technical crew. We're doing such a wonderful job bringing you the sights and sounds of what has been a terrific National League Championship Series. The series the Braves hope will be extended to Game 7. They'll need at least three runs in the ninth to do it. And wild thing is on for Philadelphia. Mitch Williams, his first pitch of the ninth, the strike to Damon Berryhill. Williams on the mound. Kim Batiste in to replace Dave Hollins at third. This combination has led to some very interesting late inning scenarios in this series. But despite the one two three inning pitch by West Williams is on and he's outside with a second pitch. Bobby Cox has Lemke and then the pitcher spot due up in this inning with plenty of pinch hitters available including Sid Bream and Francisco Cabrera Tony Tarasco and Bill Pakoda. Williams with two wins and a save in this series despite the fact that the Braves have hit 353 against him. That is one of the more improbable features of what has been a series filled with improbabilities. He struck him out. Barry Hill gone on four pitches for the first out of the nine. Williams working now to Mark Lemke. Fastball just low. Lemke's one for two tonight. He singled back in the third. He has also drawn a walk. Tough to tell where that pitch missed, but Joe West said it did. Two and all. Bill Pakoda has moved into the on deck circle to pinch hit. And it's three and all.
David West in the dugout after one one two three inning Tommy Green pitched the first seven now Williams in with a strike over the outer third six three Philadelphia and in the dugout the Phils are ready to run onto the field in celebration three balls and two strikes on Lemke. The payoff pitch. Fly ball to center. Routine play for Dykstra. Only two teams in this century have won as many as 104 games in a season without reaching the World Series. The 1909 Cubs and the 1942 Dodgers. And the Braves are one out away from becoming the third team on that list. Bill Pakoda batting for the pitcher. Ball one low. Two outs, top of the ninth. Six three, Philadelphia. One and one on Pakoda, who went up there taking a strike. Feet of Pakota, he had to skip out of the way. And Williams is behind in the count, three and one. And the top of the order, notice Nixon waits on deck. Mitch Williams has more than lived up to his nickname in this series. But should he get the Braves out here in the ninth, he'd have two wins and two saves in the four Philadelphia victories. And it's only fitting that this series should come down to a 3 2 pitch with two outs in the night. The payoff pitch. He struck him out. And the Philadelphia Phillies have won the National League pennant. In a series filled with improbabilities, this was the most unlikely ending of all, a 1-2-3 inning for Mitch Williams in the ninth. Final score of game six, the Phillies six and the Braves three, the Phillies win the NLCS four games to two.